Um, uh, I welcome our distinguished guests and speakers to uh, Middle East uh, uh, Africa Future Technologies Conference uh, 2022. Uh, I would like to remind our guests that we will uh, mute audio and video during the session. Uh, you can use the chat box below to ask your question. Uh, the speaker will answer questions uh, in chronological order, uh, and we will skip repeated questions. We will try to finish uh, three uh, to four minutes uh, before the next session, uh, but, but for today, uh, we don't have uh, another session, so uh, we have uh, uh, some more time for uh, questions uh, if needed. Uh, the recording will be shared with you uh, in the comments of the event on LinkedIn. Uh, today, I would like to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Emmanuel Goffi, uh, and ask him to introduce himself because of the rich CV, I didn't know uh, where to start. So uh, uh, it's your uh, 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 role, uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I, I, I will not dive into my personal uh, background and, and, and what I've done, but uh, basically what, what I'm doing currently, I'm I'm the co-founder and the uh, senior associate with a firm which is called Digital Ethicist. It is Sciences Numérique, uh, based located in France, and we are uh, doing training and consultancy to companies and universities or educational institutions um, in the field of uh, um, ethics applied to artificial intelligence. <clears throat> And what I'm doing also, I'm uh, co-directing with my friend uh, at Sumam Silovic, the uh, Global AI Ethics Institute, which is a think tank, which is both located in France, Paris, and in Zagreb, Croatia. And um, with this think tank, what we're trying to do is to raise awareness about the importance of uh, culture in the ethical assessment of artificial intelligence. So basically, this... Um, uh, this presentation will be kind of a mix of those two activities that we have uh, with uh, Digital Ethicist and the Global AI Ethics Institute, uh, with a real focus on obviously it is and numeric digital ethicist because uh, it is um, it is mainly um, done in favor of uh, companies that this was requested for by, by the organizer of this uh, of this um, conference. So uh, let, let me start uh, providing you with uh, some kind of overview, just because, uh, as I will repeat it during this presentation, uh, it is really important, it's always important to um, keep in mind the context in which we all operate. Uh, on the slide, you can see um, a, a, a picture of that is actually took from the uh, AI Ethics Lab, uh, representing actually the numbers of documents pertaining to AI ethics that have been published around the world. And depending on the color, uh, you can see that there are places where you have many documents that have been issued uh, and places where there are almost no or even no documents that have been uh, published in the world. So what is really striking uh, looking at this slide is that basically most of the documents that have been uh, established and published uh, today regarding AI ethics uh, have been done by Western world, by the Western world, by Global North at large. Uh, you can obviously see that the U.S. is pretty active in the uh, in this um, in this field of guidelines, AI ethics guidelines. You can also see that you have two other spots that are that are clearly visible uh, on, on the slide: uh, the European Union on one hand, uh, and the uh, in China and India on the other end. Uh, just to make sure that. Um, this picture is not misleading. When you're looking at that, it is based on countries. So it means that the color depends on how many documents have been published, issued by each country taken uh, individually, right? So this is where you see that the US at large has published a lot of these documents from the public and the private sector. Uh, and it seems at first sight that China, India are exactly at the same level as France, Spain, etc. Uh, that is a bit misleading because when we're looking at France, Spain, um, and Italy, and all those countries, they are part of something that is bigger, you know, about uh, which is the European Union. So what that means is that basically uh, most of the documents that have been published so far, and this is something that has been already stressed by the, uh, the work done by um, Anna Jamin and its team with the ETH Zurich, uh, actually most of those documents have been published issued by the Western world. The European Union is really pretty active. And when you look at 
the AI Ethics Lab uh, inventory, what you can see is that a bit more than 40 documents uh, have been published in North America, once again, by public and private actors. Uh, some 50 documents have been published by Europe and 20 by Asia. Uh, Asia, I mean, at large, right, which is which is quite concerning when you see the size of, for example, countries like China and India and their representation in terms of worldwide populations. It can be a bit weird to uh, to see that they are not that much represented at the uh, at the level of uh, you know AI guidelines uh, publications. This is basically the situation we are here. When you look closely at that, what you see and what is also really really striking is that Africa is totally absent. There is no such things as documents that have been published by Africa. There are some of them that have been published in the Middle East, uh, Bahrain, for example, uh, but it's really, really a few of them. And, and actually what that means is that mostly the um, normative landscape has been shaped by the global north. Uh, it's also something that has been stressed by Anna Jobin in their, in, in, in their work in 2019, is that um, Africa, for example, is almost totally absent of the discussion outside of, you know, uh, big international organizations such as the UNESCO, the UN, the UN and, and other organizations. But countries in Africa are actually totally absent from the debate over AI ethics or, to be um, uh, more precise, ethics applied to artificial intelligence. Concerning because uh, you see that African, the African continent is kind of a big continent and you know that the Middle East is a pretty active, pretty dynamic and pretty rich uh, part of the world. So uh, it is concerning to see that, once again, those standards, those norms have been set, established uh, mostly by, uh, by the Western world. Um, in, uh, in 2020, the UNESCO has launched a, uh, an open dialogue on AI ethics open dialogue, which was meant to encompass as much actors, stakeholders as possible, right? And even under the auspices of the UNESCO, and even if they're really proud about it, you can see that on their website, uh, only 611 participants actually uh, participated to, uh, to the dialogue, representing only 54 countries uh, around the world, right? So what we can see here, basically, is that when it comes to ethics of so-called future technologies, but we, we all understand that it is mainly focused on, on artificial intelligence. It is really addressed by a narrow uh, group of people, narrow group of individuals, narrow group of countries. Basically, uh, what we can see is that uh, even if the Western world represents only one six of the whole po the world population, it has published and, and, and uh, created two thirds of all ethical codes, ethical guidelines, and documents uh, pertaining to, uh, to AI ethics. Obviously, this poses an ethical question about the representativity of the whole world, of China, of India, of the African continent, of the Middle East. Right? It, it obviously raises the question of what is the role of this big uh, part of the world in the establishment and the setting of those um, uh, of those norms. The other point, which is pretty concerning, and this is something that I've learned from experience discussing with people in India, discussing with people in the Middle East, discussing with people in Africa and in other places, is that all those existing codes that have been set by the Western world, by the global North, have been built on Western concerns and on Western values. Uh, basically, to, to give you an idea of that, and I, will, and I will just touch upon a very sensitive subject, which is discrimination. The concerns regarding discrimination is basically a huge concern in the Western world. When you travel around the world, you will obviously um, see that there are places where discrimination is not at all a problem, it's not at all a question. It's even part of your culture in the sense that, for example, discriminating between skin colors can be considered as a way for you uh, to uh, differentiate yourself from others, right? So it's also part of your identity and it's something that is really important. Discriminating between male and female might be in some places, in some culture, totally acceptable, even desirable. 
Uh, just to be clear about that, my point is not to say that it is ethically acceptable. Uh, it is to say that it is a reality that we have to deal with, that we have to take into account, right? We cannot just deny the fact that in some places, concerns about discrimination that are uh, that, that are that are concerned that we can see uh, in the Western world are not shared universally. That's that's the truth. That's the reality of the world we live in. So most of those codes and those documents that have been established so far, they are actually based on Global North concerns and on the Global North values. And, and obviously, when I'm discussing with people, uh, I'm, I'm quite a bit working with um, uh, with the Middle East, with Bahrain, with Saudi Arabia, for example, and the EAU. Uh, I've heard here and there people that were really worried that uh, what we call the AI ethics or ethics applied to artificial intelligence might be kind of a Trojan horse for Western values. Uh, to say it in a different way, some countries are really concerned about the fact that through AI ethics code and AI ethics guidelines, the uh, Western world, the global North, is actually spreading its own perspective, its own values, its own culture around the world without really taking into account the fact that uh, you might have diverse perspective on what is acceptable and what is not regarding artificial intelligence, what is desirable and what is not desirable, once again, regarding artificial in intelligence. Uh, even some people, and, and you can find that on, on, on the web as well, are even mentioning the idea that they, they might be kind of a colon, colonial AI, right? Uh, which, which might be a problem and that uh, we might uh, fight against. So what I really want to, uh, to stress here is the fact that with AI ethics, at some point, we are denying something that, is, that has been stressed by the UNESCO as, as utmostly important, which is cultural diversity, on which we actually base our ethical consideration, our ethical assessment. Uh, the UNESCO has been pretty active in, in defending uh, cultural diversity with its uh, Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity um, uh, in 2001, but also uh, uh, warn against the potential threat uh, that AI, AI might uh, represent to the safeguard of uh, cultural heritage in 2005, specifically in a document that was uh, focused on the African continent and also in 2021. 20, uh, uh, so what they highlighted is their concerns about, about the fact that AI might, might have a strong impact and a negative impact uh, on cultural diversity and on the safeguard of cultural heritage. So this is where we really have to be uh, aware of that and where we have to fight against, uh, at some point, uh, to fight against this uh, kind of cultural politicism from uh, coming from the Western world. That's something that is really important for the Middle East for Africa, obviously, but for many other places all around the world. Um, if we uh, if we look at that, we we really think that I, I really think that uh, what is key here is the context. Uh, when we are establishing or setting those guidelines, we mostly miss the context, or we do not analyze the context properly. Uh, we are really focused on the ethics supply to artificial intelligence, but when we talk about ethics, and I would not dive into uh, deep into this uh, this slide, but just to give you kind of a, uh, a big, the big picture of it. When you're talking about ethics, you have to think about uh, something that is wider. Uh, you have to think that, or you have to understand that ethics is part of different things. Uh, it is the product of the moral codes, the moral norms that are actually regulating relation between human beings in your specific society, in your specific cultural setting. Uh, it also takes into account the laws that have been established to, uh, to regulate, once again, those, uh, uh, those relations between people. Uh, behind those norms, you will obviously find values uh, that are shaping the norms. Uh, and you have some examples of values that are taken from the Western world. For example, you will value human rights, you will value equality or equity, you will value freedom, you will value privacy, etc., etc. But all countries all around the world do not value the same thing or they do not value the things, those things at the same level. So the priority might be different, the content might be different, and the values might be different. So if you change one of those values, the norms will change, obviously. 
If you value privacy, you will have norms that will protect privacy. If privacy is not a problem or if you do not value privacy, obviously your norms will represent this, uh, this kind of perspective. If you value human rights, you will have norms that will protect human rights. Uh, conversely, if you do not think that human rights are that much important, then you will not have this kind of norms that will protect uh, human rights or you will not respect uh, rules that are uh, protecting human rights. Then values and norms are uh, embedded into what we call culture. Uh, culture is a really complex word and it's really hard to define, but I usually um, I use the definition given by Kober and Klockholm uh, on, on we, in which actually they, they uh, stress the fact that, and I quote them, uh, that, va that culture, sorry, is, the, is, is, made, is, is made of traditional ideas uh, and especially their attached values. So culture is deeply rooted into tradition, uh, into ideas, into values, right? It is also... Uh, obviously embedded in, uh, in, in, in your history, your geography, lots of things, but the culture is kind of a big thing that must be really taken into account. It's really uneasy to have clear uh, definition of culture. It's really uneasy to have also a clear uh, map of culture. That, that's not the way it works, but it is really important when we are working on the assessment of any artificial intelligence at the ethical level to take into account the, the culture uh, in which this AI product, uh, AI application has been developed or is being deployed and used. Uh, you have, for example, in some places, in some culture, and especially in the Western culture, uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the, this, this culture of control over technology, which is also the representation of the, our will to control the world we live in. Um, this culture of control over things around us, over our environment, and obviously, uh, of our technology is something that is not universally shared. In some places, you have uh, what we call the cosmogony perspective of the uh, the world around is kind of flat. Uh, people are not are, are not above things, so they are not meant to control them. They are among things, right? So they do not control them. They just have relation with them. So if you remove this culture of control, obviously your values, for example, the relation that you will have with your environment, uh, will be totally different. In, Instead of having kind of a hierarchical uh, relation with things, with you know nature, with other people, you will have kind of this, of this really equal and even relation with all of them. That will impact your values. That will impact the norms. That you will impact obviously your ethics. And the last point I wanted to mention when we're talking about uh, uh, ethics applied to artificial intelligence, obviously, is the environment, the overall environment. Geopolitics here is really key. Geography, history. Uh, the beliefs of, of your culture, of your country, uh, the political system, the resources that are available, etc. They're all shaping your culture. <clears throat> uh, just to give you a, a quick illustration of that, I, I would just talk about Afghanistan, right? Uh, we um, we uh, in the West think that democracy is something that is worth being valued. So no problem with that. So we've tried, as you know, it to... Uh, uh, copy past democracy um, in Afghanistan, but we actually did not take into account this reality, which is that if you want to install democracy in a country, first you have to have the historical background. The people have actually that actually led people to accept uh, this political system, and also you need to have the geography. When you are in a country like Afghanistan, when you are in mountains, when you have tribes and villages that are totally isolated, it is totally impossible to have kind of a, a centralized power, which is the basis of democracy, right? So if you just copy past your political system because it works on your culture, on your country, on your uh, geopolitical environment to a country or culture that is totally different, that will not work. And we've seen how it led us uh, in Afghanistan. Just to, once again, to give you um, uh, an example of that. I've myself also experienced this kind of big difference working with China on, for example, privacy. Uh, when you are in a collectivistic culture, privacy is not seen or is not understood in the same way as uh, we can understand it here, for example, in France, on what we call in what we call individualistic uh, societies. So, what does that mean for companies when it comes to um, to uh, ethics applied to artificial intelligence? Um, that means that what we are 
doing mostly is that we are taking all those norms that have been set by the Western world. We are just copy pasting them. Uh, we are just using those principles. We are actually creating codes, codes based on what the Western world has done. And what happens is that doing so, we are, uh, we are creating what the uh, World um, Forum called the intention action gap. We are actually widening the gap uh, between what we pretend and what we actually do. Let me clarify that. If you just take principles that are coming from the outside without taking into account your specific context, cultural context, your specific objectives, your all your, your personal interests, your uh, your needs, the needs of your of your people, uh, what will happen is that you will have difficulty to operationalize those principles that are actually uh, not adapted to your situation. Right. So if you cannot, if you just pretend that you will, let's say, uh, respect privacy and you see that in your specific environment, uh, respecting privacy is at most difficult, then what you will do is that you will widen the gap between what you're saying and what you're doing. And that poses a big, big issue here. Uh, you can see um, uh, on the slide a picture that has been taken from an IBM uh, study. So it is basically done through a Western, uh, Western survey. But even in the West, with kind of an homogeneous uh, cultural setting, what we've seen is that there is this big gap between what companies are actually pretending to, to do in terms of uh, ethics applied to artificial intelligence and what they are doing in reality. So just think about what would happen if you just copy past principle, you're in the Middle East, you're in Africa, you copy past those principles, you adopt them without uh, adjusting them to your specific uh, cultural setting, you will widen this gap because you will have really, really, really um, uh, uh, strong difficulties to, to apply principles to the reality of your world. If you apply privacy, which is a really individualistic perspective and principle uh, to a collectivistic society, that will not work. That will not work. Then once again, you will have this huge gap between uh, what you're pretending and what you are doing. The problem with this uh, intention action gap is that mostly end users and consumers, they can see it at some point, they can feel it. Uh, they can notice the fact that you are not really totally aligned uh, to what you're pretending. You're not doing what you're pretending. Uh, and this obviously ends up with um, uh, a lack of trust from your consumers and the end users. They will feel like, okay, they cannot, you're not reliable. They cannot trust you uh, because um, you, uh, you've adopted principles, but you are not actually able to operationalize them. Uh, they will not see about operationalization. They will mostly see that uh, through the lens of, okay, you're just selling something uh, that is ethical. You're selling principles, but you are not actually uh, doing what you uh, what you pretend to do and that's that's kind of a big issue obviously when it comes to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, the relation with your with your consumers and your end users uh, according to the IBM survey uh, in, in the Western world in the Western countries and Western companies that have been surveyed 20 percent of the executives actually are totally aware of the fact that there is this big gap between what they say and what is, for example, presented in their uh, ethical codes or, or what they pretend to, to, to be in terms of principle and, and what they actually do, what they are able to do uh, in the reality. So even when you are in a specific cultural setting like the Western world, you have difficulties to operationalize values and principle because there is a gap between the idealistic perspective of values and the realistic perspective of the market. And this is something that will be uh, obviously uh, uh, greatly improved by, by the fact that you have this cultural difference between, between different uh, countries. Big problem is that um, we are experiencing what we call a surge of AI ethics across the world. And this surge is um, obviously both illustrated by the number of guidelines and codes of ethics that have been published, but also it is 
uh, created by this number of um, uh, of guidelines, right? The, the more guidelines you have, the more uh, expectation you will you will create in, in the mind of, of people. Uh, in the survey that has been conducted by IBM, once again, 80% of the consumers and citizens and employees also uh, do feel like it is really important to take into account AI ethics for organizations. What that means is that you have a strong expectation from the society. So you have here a different situation. You might you might be a company that is operating only in the Middle East or only in Africa, right? So you will have to take into account the expectation of your specific consumers, right? But if you are operating outside of your own borders, if you're, for example, uh, doing um, doing some uh, some market with uh, with the European Union or, or the US, you will also have to adjust to the expectation of those uh, different. Uh, culture. And if you do not meet the expectation regarding uh, AI ethics, obviously you will have difficulties to uh, uh, to uh, to answer and, and, and to, uh, to answer the, uh, uh, the the need of those uh, of, of those people in the Western world. It will have obviously a strong impact uh, on on your activities, and you don't want that. So. You have, and we have, I mean, in the Middle East, that's true. In Africa, that's true. We have to take AI ethics into account. We Once again, we have to contextualize that. We do not have, we must not just apply uh, principles that have been said by others, but we really have to take it into account. We really have to integrate it in our, um, in, in our reflections, and we have to really uh, deal with it in in, uh, in our activities. That's really important, obviously. If you don't do that, uh, you will obviously face uh, strong difficulties uh, uh, in, in, in your activities. So what should be done uh, about, about all that? There are many things that must be uh, uh, that can be done for for uh, for the Middle East and Africa. Once again, which is totally or almost totally absent uh, from the debate uh, over um, AI ethics. The important thing is that the Middle East and Africa should really work uh, to establish what we call, can call the natural legal and regulatory environment uh, that would favor first trust, obviously, but also innovation. Uh, if you are able at some point to create this specific environment, uh, this favorable uh, environment, obviously you will help your companies, you will help uh, your people to develop their own ideas their, uh, and innovate in, in, the, in the field of, of, of artificial intelligence. First thing that I would uh, recommend is that companies in the Middle East and companies uh, in Africa also must at some point consider ethics applied to technologies or ethics applied to artificial intelligence. Uh, so far, there are, there are too many uh, places, too many companies that are actually not taking ethics applied to AI uh, into consideration at all. And that is a big issue. That is a big issue, and especially if you are uh, trying to, uh, uh, to to have activities uh, across borders where expectation can be really high. So the first thing would be, okay, just dive into ethics uh, of, uh, of artificial intelligence and take that into account and try to address it. Uh, really important. Second thing that is really important is that you have to do your own work. You have to do your own work. At some point, you really have to uh, anchor your own reflections about what is acceptable and what is not about uh, AI ethics into your specific cultural setting. Do not wait for others to tell you what you have to do. Do not wait for others to actually impose their perspective upon you because that will have a strong and really negative impact uh, on, on your activities. Third, uh, you might consider local objectives. You might consider specific needs uh, of your country, of your company. You might also consider native values. Local objectives is, let's say that uh, if for you, uh, if you're for your company in the Middle East or in Africa, the main objective is to product artifact that will help people to be happy, then that will shape your values, that will shape your ethics. But if you consider that 
your main objective is to make profits, then you will have a totally different value perspective. You will have a totally different strategy. But at some point you have, and this is something that is really uh, needed in the Middle East in Africa, is to decide what are your own objectives. Do not think about the objectives that are, you know, uh, those of the Western world that are those that have been uh, set by the Western world. Just think about yourself. When I'm discussing with people in Africa, for example, and I have to, I've had the discussion quite recently, um, there are some places, and that's not only in Africa, that might be also in some places in Asia. There are some places or where, where the objective, the main objective of, of most people is to survive, uh, is to free themselves from poverty. So when your ethical horizon is about, I want to free myself from poverty, and if I can do so by uh, developing, um, uh, let's say, um, an AI application or an AI artifact, I will, I will do it, whatever it costs. And I will certainly not dive deep into philosophical consideration about respect for privacy, etc. I will do whatever it takes to free myself from, from poverty. Uh, obviously, if you are in a, what I would call a spoiled country like France, you have time to think about ethical consideration and what is right and what is wrong. You're not in the same situation, right? Your objectives will be totally different. The specific needs are also really important. And this, this is where I make a difference between what I call the ethics of the essential and the ethics of the ancillary. Uh, the ethics of the essential is, once again, that's something that I've, I've, uh, I've experienced in many countries in Africa and in India, is um, that there are some places where when you, where you are, when you are deplo uh, deploying or developing an AI artifact or application is to help people survive in a very hostile environment, or in, in isolated places where they do not have access to, uh, you know, uh, hospitals and, and, and health support, this kind of thing. So you are creating and developing AI application or artifacts that are essential to the survival of those people, right? And there are places mostly in the Western world when we're developing mostly uh, technical, technological or uh, AI artifacts that are uh, that are meant to please us, right? That are that are mainly leisure uh, or, or, or what I call ancillary uh, applications. So obviously, depending on on the perspective you are uh, you are addressing, you will not have the same values that you will use. You will not have the, the same ethical uh, purposes. You will not have the same perspective on on what is to be done and what is not to be done, right? Uh, when it's a matter of survival, uh, your uh, ethical expectation will be totally different than the one uh, that you will use when it comes to uh, developing, uh, you know, a well-being application. And last point, native values are really important. Uh, native values are really, really important. I was, I, I just mentioned the fact that discrimination might be uh, something valued in some places and not valued uh, in, in others um, in other places. Uh, this is the, the kind of thing that you really have to put into your own reflection. And this is something that is really important in the Middle East. This is something that is really important in Africa, right? Because obviously the Middle East and Africa are kind of a mosaic of culture. So you will find in those different places uh, really different values, uh, depending on, once again, your history, your geography, your beliefs, your political system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you really have to make sure that um, your ethics applied to artificial intelligence will match your own values and will not match the values of other outside of your country. Uh, fourth point, it is really important when you've done that to establish native standards. Um, I, I would I would definitely recommend the Middle East and, and Africa, and especially because there are big countries, uh, big big areas, that, not big countries, but big, big areas uh, with a lot of potential, uh, not to just once again copy past standards that have been uh, set by others or just to uh, adopt uh, guidelines that have been set by others. I, I really think that at some point you have to establish your own standards and your own guidelines based on your objectives, your needs and your values, uh, which is way more, uh, I mean, efficient than just doing copy paste uh, from, uh, from others' uh, uh, documents. Also, a really important point uh, regarding the, um, uh, the Middle East and, uh, and Africa is that 
those two big areas have uh, a really dynamic and really strong gas for uh, population. And it's really important to empower them, which is something that is done, for example, in the Middle East by the uh, Digital Cooperation Organization, which is empowering the youth and the uh, and, and women also. Uh, that's that's something that you really have to um, to to use. This is a strong uh, manpower that, that that might be used. So you have to empower uh, the youth in, in in your in your uh, in your areas, because those people will be the future. While actually in the Western world. Uh, we are getting older uh, obviously the future is 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 made and and must be made can be made uh in in the middle east and in africa uh to empower your the use you, you have obviously to um, uh, to educate them and you have to improve uh, digital literacy which is uh, quite uh, quite weak uh, in in Africa in the Middle East. Even if there are lots of initiatives that have been launched that are uh, pretty um, uh, pretty efficient, uh, mostly uh, I would say in in the Middle East, uh, digital literacy is still really weak uh, in those big parts of the world. So if you do not have the sufficient level of digital literacy, you will not be able to compete against uh, other countries or other part of the world, such as the European Union. So education here would be key. And then once you have all those things, you have to participate to debate, to the debate uh, on the uh, on, on ethics applied to artificial intelligence. You have to have your voice heard at some point. And this is also something that is uh, kind of paradoxical, is that um, there are initiatives in the Middle East that are that are that are being launched, but basically they are located in the Middle East. Uh, you have obviously events that are international events that have, uh, that are organized by uh, by some Middle Eastern countries. I've participated to some of them, but basically the discussion remains really within the Middle East. When you go to Africa, the discussion remains within Africa, and when it's international, it's mostly about adopting uh, initiatives that have been launched by Canada, by the U.S., by the European Union. Uh, so you're not participating the companies are not really participating to the global debate and it's really important for them to be part of this debate just to bring to the table their own issues their own needs and to make uh the whole world know that they might have a different perspective on what is acceptable and what is not in terms of ai ethics then if you're able to do that um uh, mostly ethics applied to artificial intelligence can help you in two different ways. The first one is obviously uh, it will allow, us to, uh, allow you to, to mitigate and to avoid downside risk. Uh, risk, for example, for your reputation, risk about you know, lack of trust. So uh, you, you will be able, if you use uh, artificial intelligence, and this is something that would definitely recommend to uh, companies in the Middle East and Africa, if you, if you really address AI ethics at some point, you will be able to develop better practices, right? And then you will improve the trust uh, of, of your consumers and, and, and users, right? And uh, you might also bridge the trust gap uh, because people will feel like, okay, you are really involved into what you're doing and you are trying to, uh, once again, lower the gap between your intention and your action. Uh, but mostly, um, the most important thing, I guess, uh, that is really beneficial when, when it comes to artificial intelligence ethics is that it can also lead to uh, financial value. First of all, if you are able to contextualize AI ethics, if you are able to empower uh, part of your population, uh, if you are able to educate uh, people about uh, AI ethics, you will definitely boost innovation. People will be involved, they will more, be more creative, they will be able to, uh, to make inferences, uh, so they will be able to create, and that will play a really, really strong uh, role in the improvement of your, of your activities. But you also have, obviously, to improve skills, and that will improve skills. If you're able to bring AI ethics to the table, you will ask people to think about it, you will ask people to uh, improve their knowledge, their skills, and then you will have people at the right level to do the job instead of uh, requesting the help or consultancy from uh, other countries, which is the case uh, currently uh, in, in many, many cases. 
you can also improve uh, the financial value by uh, by meeting the expectation of your customers of, of your employees and investors right uh, if your customers employees and investors are happy if they're, they're they're comfortable with what you're doing obviously you will create kind of this strong ecosystem uh, on which you can count and and on which you can build something new and that will obviously boost innovation and um, also ai ethics is more and more and so that's something that is uh, slowly changing in the western world so that might be taken into consideration by uh, the Middle East and Africa, is that AI ethics is now considered as a competitive advantage. Uh, what I mean by that is that mostly when you are able to say, OK, I'm really addressing ethical issues related to artificial intelligence. I'm doing that for real. And I just try to limit the gap between my intention and my action. You're sending a strong message about what you want to do what your values are uh, and what your objectives are right so uh and and since all all companies are not doing the same uh you will you will be a bit different and this difference might have a strong impact once again on your on your activities so uh what is needed what is needed uh especially uh, now for for companies is to um, to train skilled ethicists first of all take into account ethics applied to artificial intelligence. Uh, try to make it native. Do not just adopt others' uh, perspective. Train your own people on your needs, on your objectives, uh, on your values. Train them about that and train your own ethicist. Train people to think or to reflect in an ethical uh, way. And then you will be able maybe to lower this uh, uh, this gap between uh, your intention and your action and you will be able to align uh, what you're saying what you're pretending with what what you're doing and that is uh that is something that is uh, really important as we've seen it uh, for many people all around the world uh, consumers are really uh, sensitive to this uh, to this uh, to, to this, this kind of thing so train skilled ethicists uh and and work on ethics uh, I don't think I will go further. I'm uh, already running out of time, so I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. Uh, uh, some of the questions uh, that, uh, that we have uh, for, uh, for this great session uh, uh, I will uh, keep it uh, just after uh, uh, Raja uh, speaks, so Raja can speak, and then we can proceed with the questions. Uh, please sure. go ahead, uh, Raja. Uh, okay. We can't hear your voice. We, we, we still can't hear you. Uh, it looks like uh, you, your mic is working, but we can't hear your voice. So uh, you can write uh, the question or the comment in the text, and I will read it if you want. Um, uh, 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 Raja's uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, since you said that every country uh, uh, needs to adapt their own system of eth ethical definitions, how do you think that uh, can be ac accomplished considering the globalization and the westernization of the world? 
That is, that is a tricky question. Thanks, Raja, for this <laughs> for this question. Uh, okay. Uh, so th th there, are, there are, I mean, there are two things. The first thing is to uh, maybe first I would invite people to question this uh, this goal, which is to create kind of a global you know governance of artificial intelligence, which is based on universalist uh, perspective. That is Western perspective on on the world, right? Uh, basically, the idea that is behind this global governance is to say that there are universal values out there, which I do not believe in at all because it has never been proved, technically speaking. Uh, and so based on the fact that there are universal values, then you can build on those values a universal code of ethics. Uh, so obviously, this is the question that we have to uh, to, to ask ourselves. Uh, is there such thing as universal values? Uh, and if not, that means that there is no way to have this kind of global governance. So that the first thing. The second thing is to uh, to, to consider, as, as uh, Haja mentioned, the fact that we are in the process of the westernization of, of, of values or uh, AI ethics. Uh, it, it, it is where we really need to have this kind of native perspective. Doesn't mean that we have to fight against each, each other uh, uh, in, in some places and in some cases. We'll suddenly find that we have some common purposes, we have some common values here and there, and, and then we'll make we'll be able to make compromises. And, and if you built, um, let's say, global governance, which would be kind of a global regulation uh, on compromises, I think that would be way more long-lasting, efficient, and fair than establishing global governance based only on Western perspective that have been imposed to the rest of the world, right? It's all about diplomacy for all people that are doing mediation. It's really important not to impose your perspective on others because that will not work. Uh, if you really want to have this kind of global governance, meaning kind of a... Uh, uh, an international treaty or international instrument that will uh, frame the design, development, and use of artificial intelligence for the benefit of uh, of the greatest number. You really have to build that on a compromise. Uh, that's not the perfect solution because there is no perfect solution. There is no uh, uh, perfect way to to, uh, to to address this this big issue about the ethics out of, of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not an easy task. It's a long-lasting task. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes a strong political will to to dive into the intricacies of of ethics. And uh, because I know Raja's work on on uh, the Vedic approach and the Indian perspective on AI, I know how, how complex it might be to dive into you know AI ethics from a cultural standpoint and to adjust it to a specific cultural setting. But whatever the difficulties, it is the only way to a fair and efficient and long-lasting uh, governance. Uh, what, what I can see uh, now is uh, that because there are, there, there's been so many documents that have been uh, uh, published by the, uh, by the Western world, I can see that in some places like China, for example, they are trying to uh, counter this you know, uh, norm proselytism by acting really strongly and really actively at the standards level because they feel like they cannot they cannot uh, fight against the the big norms the big principles that you will find uh, in in many uh, western uh, documents now uh, they just gave up about that and they are strongly strongly working on the standardization which is actually the articulation between principles and the market and the reality which is kind of a really smart move uh, right because uh, you can apply and you will not have this kind of difficulty where, between the intention and the uh, and the action actually you are just shaping the standards which means that you are shaping the way people will have to act uh, regarding this or that uh, AI sector so they they found a way to actually uh, counter this uh, uh, this strong action by the uh, by the European Union, the Western world in, in in the in the realm of norm. What I can see also is that uh, you have lots of countries that actually will not apply them. They will not apply those rules at some point. And and I, I like to make the uh, uh, the parallel with uh, human rights. Would say that lots of people do believe that human rights are universal, but when you look closely at how they are they are applied uh, all around the world, you feel like the, even countries that are actually endorsed human rights are not applying it correctly. That's the case for France, for example, right? So uh, if if we if we if we 
keep going the same way uh, if we keep accepting the fact that the Western world is setting the rules and the standards, um, we will fail. We will have a multiplication of norms uh, that will be uh, difficult to follow, that will be difficult to operationalize because they will not fit uh, specific needs and specific uh, cultural uh, settings. And um, it, that will lead also to, uh, you know, a strategy to counter uh, those norms. And instead of regulating uh, the, uh, the design, development and use of artificial intelligence, we will deregulate it. And, and that that's my big concern. I don't know if I answered your, uh, your question, Roger, but... Uh, 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 the, the second uh, question, uh, um, what would be the extreme scenario if MEA region uh, is not involved in shaping uh, AI ethics? Um, the, the, uh, the worst scenario, I think, is, um, is to either create new tension between, uh, between different parts of the world. I don't like this idea of, you know, uh, uh, tension between cultures because that does not really make sense to me. But... Uh, you, you, you might you might create new tension uh, upon upon the the stakes that are uh, that are related to to, to artificial intelligence, uh, and you might also improve existing tension, which is already the case between, for example, the U.S. and China, uh, that are the two main actors in artificial intelligence, and and you can see that there are existing tension that are the product of history within the the East and the West. And that have been increased, and that are increased in some, in, to some extent, uh, by by the fight uh, or the race uh, for for AI supremacy. So that that might be the big issue. The the, the other issue uh, might be related to the fact that there is a strong link between respect for cultural diversity, human dignity, and international security. And this is something that you can find in almost all regulatory documents that have been set by the, the UN, for example. You look at the UN Charter, and you will see that there is a relation between, between those uh, different elements, which is why mostly the UNESCO is, uh, uh, is calling for, for respect for cultural diversity. If you do not respect cultural diversity, it means that you do not respect human dignities. Uh, and if you do not respect human dignity, you're creating uh, a situation of... Of, of tension, of insecurity that might lead at some point to, uh, to some conflictual situation. So the worst case uh, scenario would be to have tension exacerbated by, uh, uh, by this, um, uh, this lack of recognition of, of cultural diversity. And also what I've seen, and I was talking about the Trojan horse, what I've seen in many places is that some people are really concerned once again about this cultural proselytism that is done through, uh, through artificial intelligence ethics uh, and, and some people are actually fighting against that when, I, when I'm, say, I'm saying fighting I'm, I'm saying that uh, at, at the literal uh, level it's, it's, they're really fighting they're, they're really 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 concerned about that and they actually reject any kind of uh, uh, Western cultural hegemony or uh, Western cultural uh, proselytism so you see that at some point, it's not only an ethical issue because I don't feel like it's it's legitimate or it's it's ethically acceptable to impose our perspective on the rest of the world. Uh, and neither it would be uh, acceptable to have China imposing its perspective on on AI ethics uh, to to the Western world. Uh, it's also a matter of of security. And, and once again, I would definitely advise uh, people to uh, to have a quick look at uh, international norms, international regulations about. Uh, uh, security and the, you will see that there is this big link between cultural diversity, respect for cultural diversity, respect for dignity and, and, uh, and human security. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the next question, what would be the starting points uh, that the MIA uh, region companies should uh, consider when they, con when they consider AI ethics? Like, uh, uh, how should they start? Um, they, they, they should start by, I, I would say, okay, first, first step is to, uh, to uh, either find people that are, uh, that are specialists in, in AI ethics. And that, that's something that I would recommend to uh, the Middle East and Africa, but also to the rest of the world. Uh, lots of people that are actually uh, in the AI ethics field are not ethicists. They do not have the sufficient background. They do not have the sufficient uh, knowledge and, and just... To give you a quick illustration of that, I, I, I'm working myself on a on a master class uh, on on AI ethics to train ethicists, and I, I've 
I had a quick look, really quick look at uh, some, uh, you know, position that are offered here and there in the European Union. 85 to 90 percent of them, uh, when they are posted, they request a background in laws, not in philosophy, while ethics is about philosophy. So basically what we have is a lot of people that are involved in the ethical deliberation, ethical or the setting of ethical standards. They do not have the knowledge. They do not have the skills. They do not have, uh, you know, uh, the competencies to, 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 to do so, which means that it obviously has an impact on the quality of, of, those, of those standards. So what I would recommend to the Middle East and African uh, companies is that just ask people that are specialized. Ask also people that have a strong knowledge, understanding, or that have a deep awareness about cultural diversity, right? If you just, uh, let's say that if you are hiring um, a consultancy group uh, from the European Union and that, uh, that those consultants uh, do not have uh, a clear knowledge or a clear understanding of the stakes uh, related to cultural diversity, what you will do is just uh, you will have people that will tell you what they've heard, uh, which is basically main, mainstream discourse about AI ethics. So they will bring into your company uh, ideas that are coming from the West. Uh, and this is where it is really difficult. You, you really have to find people that are, uh, that, that are open to cultural diversity. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you will find those people in your own country, right? Or you can start groups of discussion or you can start training people that will that will at some point have these skills you can start uh, start training uh, uh, the youth in in, in uh, educational institutions uh, to think ethically speaking uh, based on their own values or their own standards right you have to train them so uh, so that that's the first thing that you have to do you have to rely on people that have the skills and that people that have the open mindedness to uh, uh, to integrate the cultural diversity, uh, cultural diversity into into their ethical uh, reflections. Uh, th that that would be great. It, it's also also connected to the reskilling uh, concept that uh, I'm concerned with. Uh, uh, Africa needs like more uh, reskilling, uh, not just in technology, but also but also in the ethic ethical part of the artificial intelligence. Uh, so it's it's a very important point that uh, you mentioned. Uh, yeah. What would uh, drive participation further in this domain? What would that drive? What what would drive participation oh. further in this <laughs> domain? I, I, I mean, the, the 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 main drivers for companies is profits. So as soon as companies will understand that um, uh, doing ethics applied to artificial intelligence is not only about mitigating or avoiding risk, but it, that it is also about leveraging their activities. Um, I guess AI ethics will maybe uh, move up into their priority list. Uh, it, it's something that that is really lacking, uh, I guess, in the Middle East and Africa for many reasons, but it's also lacking here in the Western world and, and, and the global North at large. Uh, companies do think or do feel that AI ethics is really important, but they do not consider it as um, enough important to uh, to capitalize on it. And that, that's that's the big issue. That's the big issue. And this is where I guess maybe uh, areas such as the Middle East or, or Africa uh, can have kind of a competitive advantage. If, if you are able to take the lead on that and if you have if you are able at some point to say, Okay, we we are we are taking uh, AI ethics into account. Uh, we are uh, we are putting money on, on the table. We are we are able to to capitalize on on that. Um, they might they might at some point uh, take the lead uh, in, in 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 the in the development of, of AI ethics. And and once again, companies do have to to understand that uh, the expectations from the general public and, and the expectation from from consumers and end users um, are are really strong. And, and you cannot avoid them, right? Uh, you, you, you cannot uh, you cannot deny their, their expectation. You cannot. You really have to take them into account. And if you want to improve your activities, at some point you will have to meet those expectations, right? So if the expectations are uh, are for companies to be more ethical or to develop uh, AI that is more beneficial or more responsible or whatever the principle that you want to adopt, uh, then those companies they will have to accept it.
right? This is something that we can see already with environmental issues, uh, sustainable development. There is a strong expectation and companies have now to take that into account in their own activities. They have to show that they are doing something in favor of, uh, of the environment. Uh, that might be exactly the same uh, system, the same strategy uh, for artificial intelligence ethics. Uh, great. Uh, uh, the last question. What are the main challenges that you have seen in AI ethics during your experience in Africa and Middle East? Um, I, I would say biggest, uh, biggest challenge is to make people once again aware of the importance of AI ethics and, and being aware. And, and that's paradoxical uh, to make them aware of the importance of their own culture. Uh, you know, when, when you do not have the knowledge, when you do not have the skills in AI ethics, uh, you mainly count on others' skills. And, and since most skills are, are in the Western world, you, you just feel like, okay, all those people that are coming from France, from the US, from Canada, from Germany, from uh, wherever it is in the global north, they have the skills, so you just count on them. Yeah, but they have the skills in their own cultural setting, right? So the, the, big, the big issue that I have mostly is to tell those people, okay, do not adopt uh, principles that are not native principles. Do not adopt principles or values that do not fit your specific needs and objectives. And, and that's something that people do not understand. And they, even when they understand that, they, they feel like, OK, but we do not have the resources here to start <clears throat> the reflection on, on, this, uh, on this particular aspect of artificial intelligence. We don't know where to start. And once again, this is where uh, this is what I was saying. This is where you you really need to uh, to find skilled people. But that that's yes. Basically, the big issue is to to make people aware that there is a need for AI ethics and there is a need for native AI ethics. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, uh, like, didn't you think about uh, 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 creating like uh, 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 a reskilling project for AI ethics in collaboration with the international donors in Africa, for example? That uh, no, that no, that that's that's, uh, that's something I never thought about. That might that might be definitely um, uh, a good idea. Uh, the, the the big problem also with with the African continent, much more than with the Middle East, is that. Uh, interests are, are, are not even in, in, in the, on, the, on the continent. Uh, first of all, you have a big difference between the interest of uh, political leaders and uh, the needs and expectations of the population, right? Uh, so you have to counter that. And, and working with Africa, uh, for me, is really difficult because mostly I can see that um, uh, lots of African you know, uh, decision makers or leaders are really prone to follow the uh, the European rules just because they have some interest to to, to do so, uh, independently of, of of what is important for their own constituencies and, and populations. So this is also that something that that we have to work. I, I guess there is much more of a um, interesting and uh, and promising dynamic in the Middle East than in Africa. I, I think that that really Africa has has to free itself. Uh, from this cultural hegemony from, from the Western world and from the rest of the world when you see how China is active on the African continent. Uh, and I think that it, it's much more difficult to have this kind of native uh, reflection in Africa than it might be uh, in, in the Middle East. But that, that might be a, a great idea that, uh, that we could discuss further. Why not? Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Uh, we, we really enjoyed this uh, 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 insights uh, that you have shared with us uh, um, and also uh, we face the same uh, uh, challenge uh, regarding uh, uh, blockchain mm -hmm. because the transparency part of the blockchain uh, doesn't doesn't uh, work much in Africa uh, yes. for the same reasons that you mentioned yes so right, right. Uh, but we're hope we're hopeful that uh, uh, we, uh, we, with continuous work, we managed to to uh, to bring some light uh, for this domain. Uh, I Hopefully. think that was uh, ha has like uh, a final question. Yes, please. So, so Raja, please uh, share with us. No, no, I don't have a question. I was clapping. 
Oh, okay. Thank you, Roger. Okay. We, we can hear you now. We can hear you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Thank, uh, Dr. Thanks. Manuel. Thanks for having uh, me. It was a pleasure. And uh, if you like to add uh, uh, any final comment before uh, uh, we stop the recording and we share it with our uh, audience uh, uh, on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. The uh, f final point would be okay if 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 you are willing and you think that uh, uh, you're interested in, in in maybe developing further this idea of having a, a native uh, ethical AI reflection, uh, please contact me. That I would be really happy to uh, to to work with people of goodwill and people that are uh, enough open-minded to uh, uh, to understand the the ins and outs of of this uh, of, of this really specific field. So just yeah, please please contact me. I would be really really happy to to work with you. It would be great because we already uh, have been trying to uh, bring that uh, idea of reskilling Africa and Middle East mm -hmm. for the past two years. Uh, we have been facing some uh, challenges with the funding, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, AI ethics would be uh, a great fit as well uh, with so the fun. other technologies that uh, that we want to bring to to, that, to this region. Certainly, certainly. Certainly. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Take care. You too. You too. Bye-bye.